Hello, YouTube. Welcome. And today I have a very special friend and guest, Andrea Terrassa. Did, did I say that wrong? You, did, did no, you it? totally got it right. It's Andrea Terrassa. So welcome to the show. Uh, Andrea is a model, actress, dancer, do it all, traveled around the world and studied in a bunch of places. So what made you go into acting? I noticed that you used to study telecommunications. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's kind of a, a long and strange story, but um, to, to go back to the basics of it, when I was a kid, I used to do impressions of people. Uh, like my mom would have like these parties and I'd go up and I'd like imitate the guy next to her and it was ridiculously like accurate. So <laughs> it was like the adults would laugh, but the person being, you know, imitated would be like, hmm, that's a little like too good. <laughs> Um, so I asked my mom when I was a kid, you know, cause I went through this really long route of getting to act. I'm like, did you think I was going to end up in this? And she's like, oh yeah, we knew, we knew the minute <laughs> we were doing impressions of people and it was, you know, uh, really good for a kid. Um, so yeah, my, my family did post-production meaning like editing. Okay. They launched the first, uh, they launched like HTV in Miami back in the nineties. So that think of it like, a. MTV, but like for Latin music videos, <laughs> except wow. back then Latin artists didn't really make music videos. So it's like, what do we put on the channel? But anyway, um, so I grew up coming home from school and like seeing people edit, seeing that environment, seeing people get interviewed. Wow. Um, and I was always just like, I don't want to do anything like that. You know, like being rebellious. Um, <laughs> I always loved dance because I have mm. a, a deep passion for like music. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to be a dancer. Like when I got to college, I was like, I'm going to be a dancer. And I had done belly dance um, before that. Okay. Um, and I was like a 13-year-old, you know, in, in like these belly dance classes with like these middle-aged women who were just like, find the goddess in you. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I found the goddess in me. So um, I really got into belly dancing. And when I got to college, I was like, well, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? I really wanted to study dance. And my mom was like, well, if you're going to do something like dance where your career is potentially only until you're like 35, maybe 40, mm. you need to study a backup. Um, so I was like, okay. And I went through this, you know, route. Um, and I decided on broadcast journalism, telecommunications, because I really like TV and I like being in front of the camera. So I did, and you could probably find some of them online, but I used to do newscasts. So it'd be like, hello and welcome to WFT. My name is Andrea Tarasa and today in the news. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, and I did radio too, because I love, I love radio actually more than broadcasting. So that's where I started in telecommunications. Um, and I was really, you know, I really loved it. And I was great at like the editing and, um, in, but I, I found that I really liked going out on the street and like interviewing people. It was like, wow. tell me your life story. And, and people would talk to me and it just like, even the most like normal things mm -hmm. really interested me. Uh, and I would always like go for the really quirky people. So about halfway through my college years, um, I started, we were required as dancers to take acting one. Really? And I think in like, yeah, we were required because when you're dancing, sometimes there's a, um, well, not sometimes, most of the time you're performing a character or you're trying to tell a story through movement, right? Dance is very similar to theater except that you generally you don't speak. You're doing it through body movements and that mm. in turn elicits a reaction in the audience. So we were required to take acting one. And I was like, I really like this because our teacher for acting one, his name was Dr. Mikhail Pinkney. Um, he's like an old school, you know, like broke his, not broke his teeth. <laughs> that's the wrong way of saying, but um, cut his teeth. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Cut his teeth like in New York theater. Um, and he was like bringing us up like, you guys are going to be actors and like, this is what your life is like and it's hard. And like, he was like giving us the, you yeah. know, not the foofy foofy BS. Like, he was just like, you want to be an actor? Like, this is it. And I was just in this class. Like, I, I just wanted to like learn how to act, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, so that progressed and I was like, I really like this. And we, the dance building, I went to the University of Florida, uh, okay. Go Gators. So <laughs> the University of Florida, the dance department is really close to the, the acting department. So I'd be like, I really like what you guys are doing over there. So then it came time for me to like start auditioning for shows. Um, oh, and at wow. first I couldn't get into any of the shows at UF because it was like, there's a hierarchy, you know, like the BFAs, because that's their degree, they get cast, then the BAs get cast, and then like everyone else gets cast wow. and whatever. Um, but I'm really stubborn. 
So I, I did some community theater outside of that just to like do theater and get a feel for it because I'd never done it before. My first show ever was Lydia. Uh, it's a show by Octavio Salas and it was directed by uh, Kathy Byrne at the Acrosstown Rep Repertory Theater. And that was my first like professional but not professional production because obviously it was community theater but it was a big deal, and I got the lead in that wow. role. Um, and I, I don't know if you know anything about the play, but my character, her name was Ceci, and she, um, it's kind of like a fantastical, it's, it's um, a Latin playwright, Latin American playwright, so a lot of Latin plays have to do with like fantasy and reality. Mm -hmm. So this character was physically disabled and she like would go between being physically disabled and then having these monologues where she would stand and just, you know, say these beautiful things. So I was literally on stage for the whole three hours <laughs> um, because I couldn't move. So it really worked that I was a dancer because the physicality really helped with that. And then that's where I fell in love with theater. I was like, this is, this is what I want to do with my life. This is what's like fulfilling to me. Wow. Um, so then I started auditioning for the UF productions and it was tough because everything is made for you to not get in because you're technically not a theater major, right? And there's like right. spots and whatever. So I really had to fight. Like I had to but build really stop you. Having it. Yeah, having no, it never it never stopped, but it was it was such a good like now that I look back on those right. years, like it was such a good way to start because I was so hungry and I was so like, I wanna do this and you're not gonna stop me and you can't stop me from learning. Um, and I I never thought in my head that I couldn't. It was always like, I can do this, I, you know, and some, some things I didn't get cast in, but other things I was so diligent and so like, I would go talk to the teachers and I'd be like, I just want to learn, you know, like, even if I, I don't get a lead or whatever, I don't care. I just want to be there for rehearsals, you know, and that um, is really what propelled me to be able to do two productions at the University of Florida before I graduated. That's so interesting because a lot of, of people, they, they're instant gratification minded or they're like, I need this right away. They don't get it. And then they stop. How important has your journey been to just have a curious mind or learning or taking that initiative that wasn't just handed to you because you're not in that particular department? Yeah, nothing. It's everything. Tenacity, I think, is what makes you keep moving forward. And also, you have to like what you do. You know, like I, <laughs> when I was a kid, my mom said, she's like, you can do whatever you want with your life. She's very, I have very supportive family. They're like, but you really have to love what you do mm. uh, and wake up every morning and like it. And you have to be the best that you can be at it. Mm. So that's something I grew up with. And that work ethic of like, you want something, no one's going to hand it to you. You know, I was, I, did, I guess I just didn't grow up in a household where it was like, I want this. So like, I get it. You know, it was like, I want this and like, I'm going to show that I want it. And like, if you can help me, that's great. And if not, I'll figure out how to do it myself. Mm. You know, um, I think curiosity is essential to the actor. You have to like people. You have to be interested in people and why things happen. And, you know, it drives my, uh, my partner crazy sometimes because <laughs> we'll go, we'll talk about situations. I'll be like, yeah, but like, why, like, why did this person do this? Or like, why is this happening in the world? He's like, sometimes there's no why. And I'm like, no, there's <laughs> always why. You know, there's always, and that's what makes it interesting. That's mm. because no human being is the same. My grandmother used to say, cada persona es un mundo. Every person is a world that was mm. formed by their experiences, their perceptions, and their beliefs. Mm. So it's like, isn't it so cool that, because I know, Brian, you're also an actor, but isn't it so cool that we as artists get to like explore that and get to like that, make that's actually part culture. of the reason why i, I went into it, it it too because i feel like creativity human imagination ha has a higher threat like it, it seems like there's no limitation to it yeah I, I don't i don't think there is honestly i think imagination is like love it's like, you know, infinite, like you can manifest as much of it right. as you want at any moment, you know? No, de definitely. And it's, it's definitely curious because I'm looking down and you're actually able to take very different roles. Like one of them, you're a chef. One of them, it says demon. One of them, it says Latina. And the other one says pretty Latina. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like, so distinguish for me the difference between a Latina and a pretty Latina. 
Um, well, that was, honestly, that was mostly just the way the um, role was listed when I auditioned for it and when I was cast as it. Um, but it did have to do with, like, the actual scene. Mm. So, like, Pretty Latina was this, it was the first feature I did. Mm. And it was kind of, that character was a little bit more um, flaunting her femininity and her sexuality okay. as a Latina woman. Okay. Um, so it was very, like, that role was very focused on that characteristic of that character. Uh, and then the Latina role was just more, like, focused on a character that had really deep uh, Lat Latina American okay. roots and characteristics. Um, it wasn't necessarily so so much highlighting sexuality, even though that is part of the like Latina America identity and feminine identity at times. Okay. Um, but that one was more just like into the roots of like what it is to be a Latina in <laughs> America. How has your, your family been able to shape you or have, has your culture been able to shape you in this world of acting, giving you like a unique perspective. Yeah, so I, it's funny. Um, my family is quite small and okay. my family is all women, except for my uncle. Uh, wow. So it was, I grew up with, and my grandfather. So I grew up with my mom, my aunt, my grandmother, my grandfather, my uncle. Wow. Later on, my uh, cousin came into play. So she's 12 right now, she's a circus artist. Wow. Um, she's a, yeah, she came out a girl. So the only person in my family right now who is a male is my uncle. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the nineties, kind of nineties, early two thousands, let's say, um, where things were already kind of like progressing, mm -hmm. but I grew up with all women. So like for me, the whole, um, thing that a lot of women struggle with and I, you know, I struggle with as a grown woman, um, in the U S. <laughs> And, and honestly, all over around the world of like sexism and the sexualization of women and all that, I didn't really grow up with a lot of that. You know, sometimes Latin culture has a reputation for being machista. Um, machista meaning like the man leads, you know, and like women are supposed to be feminine and um, there's women are supposed to fit into this box, men are supposed to fit into this box. Um, and these are like the social norms. I didn't really grow up with a lot of that. Um, just because like I have an all woman family and my family's partly from, Ven like grew up in Venezuela, but my family roots are from Spain, like from the mm. island. Um, so that definitely like had a big impact on me because growing up, I remember like now that I look back, you know, I had incidents where like I had a teacher who was like, Andrea, you're so bossy, you know, <laughs> and I'd come home and, I, and I'd tell my mom, but it, it was, it was one of those things where like the boys in class would do the same things I was doing. Correct. Correct. It wouldn't get called bossy, you know? So I'd right. come home and I remember like telling my mom, like, Ma, like, my teacher said I was bossy. My mom's like, you know, what does that even mean? Because my family is first generation immigrants, you know? To okay. here. So they learn English before coming. And at, like my mom studied in New Jersey, actually, when she was a teenager, English. Mm -hmm. um, but there were still some things that like get lost in translation. Mm -hmm. So I remember my mom just being like, I don't know. What does it mean? I go, Mama, I don't know. She's like, mm -hmm. I think it means that you uh, are mandona or you like say things. And I go, yeah. She's like, I don't think that's a bad thing. I go, I don't think so either. You know? Right. So like, stuff like that uh, really shaped who I am and like just mm -hmm. not as an adult, like not letting certain things stop me. Not thinking that because um, I'm female or I'm Hispanic or I'm whatever mm -hmm. X, you know, whatever you want to say, like that's not going to stop me. Don't get me wrong. Like you experience a certain degree of racism and certain things, um, mm. you know, <laughs> just because of the time and place that we live in and historically, but that doesn't mean that I let that stop me. You know, mm. my mom didn't let that stop her. My family didn't let that stop her. And my mother and my aunt both have accents in English. So mm. it's very apparent that they're, you know, English isn't their first language. And I've seen like the really racist um, comments and the like, get out of my country and this and that. Mm. And I remember, you know, like being, I want to say 10 years old because my English is perfect. I'm like native and my Spanish is also perfect. Mm -hmm. So you can't really tell. And I remember being a kid and like having those things happen and me having to step up as a 10 year old and be like, Hey, don't talk to my mother that way. Or don't, you know, she's not less of a human being because of mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. So that in itself formed who I am as a person. Um, and my like level of empathy and my desire to be an artist because I'm an artist because I think, um, it's my, 
responsibility and my purpose in life to create artwork that helps mm -hmm. make the world a better place or that helps impact humanity in a positive way. And that's a lot of that's based on like my family, how I grew up, the fact that I was like required to be a tenacious mm -hmm. human being um, and that I saw so much of that growing up, you know, and, I, it, and that I was raised so that it didn't limit me as a person. Um, so yeah, that's my family's awesome. I, I love that. <laughs> that's definitely like having having to step into the role of protector at mm -hmm. ten is is pretty impressive because you 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 learn. It seems that you've learned to fight for others fundamentally at a very young age. Just to, to step in is like you know I don't care who you are, it could be mm -hmm. whoever, but I'm going to stand up for you because it, it's a sense of moral responsibility. And you have a very approachable, you're a very approachable person from like the fact that I like, it's like, Hey, how are you? So, <laughs> so, so I also noticed that, that you actually take your very approachable nature and you also studied at many different places as well. You didn't stop your education in the university of Florida. You, you Royal Academy of dramatic arts, Shakespeare yeah. in London, UK. Odin Week, I, I can't even pronounce it because I have ignorance of that. Denmark, another uh, theater in, in Den Denmark, and Austria too, Germany. So how has your approach to sharing the human condition influenced your decision to also learn in what it seems to be vastly different countries? Yeah. Um, so I... The best thing I learned, I guess, when I was starting out acting, um, I really disliked ego in other actors that I viewed that wasn't helpful or wasn't positive or wasn't contributing to the greater purpose of the work we were creating. So when I started acting, I told myself, I, you know nothing, you know, mm -hmm. or like, let's start from scratch. Why? Because that allows you to learn. It allows you to put your ego to the side you know, that need to look good on stage or to do this or to do that. And I told myself, I'm just going to be like a blank slate, even though you're not right. Like, because I had years of dance, mm. um, which later on translated into like my physical theater training. Mm -hmm. um, but I told myself, I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm not going to be one of those students who talks back and goes, I know more than you teacher or like, what you know, like everything I did was with intention. I think mm. intention is so important. You know, it was the intention of, I want to learn. So I went to this teacher, my acting one teacher, uh, Mr. Michael Pinkney, and I said, I want to be an actress. How can help me? Like, what do I need to do to be an actress? Because I was already two years, maybe this was about my third year into college. Mm -hmm. So my, my, I had two degrees. Um, so I needed to finish those. I couldn't switch because Florida had this, I, I don't know if they still have this rule, but it was like, if you went over the credit hours for your degree or a certain mm -hmm. number of credit hours, um, they charged you double for those classes. So a class wow. that would cost $300 was $600 wow. because they were trying to get people to get out of college, um, which I thought was stupid, but hey, not my circus, not my monkeys. So he said, well, honestly, if you want to be good, you should start with Shakespeare. Your basis should be Shakespeare. He's like, we start, we do it the other way around here. We start with contemporary and then we go to Shakespeare. So me being me, um, I was like, I want to study Shakespeare. I don't feel like I'm going to get what I need to get in Florida. Um, I would either have to go to New York or London. And because my mentality is I want to learn from the best. I want mm. like, I'm a blank slate. I don't know anything. So this is going to be my basis. Mm. Um, I was like, what are the best Shakespeare schools? What are the schools that have, you know, and it was like Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, RADA, Lambda. Um, and I think there was one other one that I was looking at and I decided on RADA. So mm. I had saved, this is how the universe is crazy. I had saved money since my freshman year um, of college because I was like, I want to study abroad. I want to study abroad at some mm. point. Um, but I didn't know where because I was still deciding on my degree, right. but I was saving my money. You know, I, I knew I had faith that like the universe had something prepared for me. So when I hit my last year, I was trying to see if I could study abroad with the school. And they were mm. like, no, you're not an acting major, so you can't. So I was like, screw this. I'm going to do my own study abroad. <laughs> So I went to London and I studied Shakespeare at RADA for the summer. Um, through that experience, I was able to go to Stratford-upon-Avon 
because mm -hmm. it's just a train right away. Um, I was able to see Shakespeare performed at the Royal Shakespeare Company, mm -hmm. which is the first time in my life I had ever seen Shakespeare done. And I was like, I freaking get it. I understand it. I, I totally understand. I, like, I was like, I'm not at that level yet, but I understand what it's supposed to be because the actors were so good and they were just saying Shakespeare in a way that you could understand it, even though it's like this, you know, foreign language. So that was the, my first like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And I went by myself, Brian. I think I was in my like mid, no, early 20s, went to Europe by my, my mother was like, you know, supportive, but like on the inside, like terrified. Um, and I went with my backpack and I just like, I was like, I'm going to learn this. After that, I went to study in Austria with this amazing teacher and mentor. His name is Sergei Ostrenko. Mm -hmm. And he runs this, um, this theater program, I guess, or like this training program. Um, it's called IUGTE. So mm -hmm. it's International School, I think, of Physical Theater. I'm maybe butchering it a little because it, I, I just call it IUGTE. Right. Um, and he also has this other program for directing called NIPAI, um, mm -hmm. N-I-P-A-I. But he's, he's, so he came from like the Russian school of theater and he studied physical theater. So I went because I would, because somebody had posted it uh, like on the UF newsletter. And I was like, well, I'm already going to be in Europe. So like I might as well, you know, go study with him. And that was like a life changing experience wow. for me because you go to this castle in Austria, you're there for like a week studying physical theater. Not even like, we didn't even get to talking or the verbals yet. It was just physical no words, just and your body in space. Body because, because that's kind of like the basis, you know, I learned like the classical basis of everything. And um, there were students from all over the world, Brian. So it was like, there were Italians, there were uh, people from London and other parts of Great Britain. There was, I think one person from Australia, there was a girl who studied at Yale in like, I think it was Connecticut, mm -hmm. um, or she lived in Connecticut. I mean, it was ridiculous because you get into this space. So you would watch, for example, like the Italians would work and they just, their, their, their expression, they would transform immediately because right. they're coming from Comedia del Arte. Okay. So they're training the basis as comedia and you'd be like, whoa, like that's so sick, you know? Or the Australians would have another style. We had a girl who was um, from Spain and she was a dancer. So like I connected with her, but so then you watch her work and you're just like, holy, you know, like there's so much that other cultures have artistically and you observe it and you're just like, holy cannoli, you know, like this is so cool. And I didn't even know that this was possible. And then you had a teacher who was so just like amazing and so like uh, you guys work together and you don't speak the same language, but you don't need to speak because you're using your body. So that was my basis um, wow. in theater. Yeah. And then while I was there, the Italians, we were having a conversation and I'm still friends with them. Right. Um, and they were just like, ah, do you know of the Odin Theatret? <laughs> and I was like, oh, like I'm from the other side of the pond. Like I know, you know, Stella Adler, Uta Hagen, uh, Meissner, uh, you know, Strasbourg. Like that's what we know. And they're like, no, no, no. There's, so there's this dude and his name is like Eugenio Barba. And he like came out of uh, Grotowski. And I was like, what's Grotowski? You know, because we don't really hear about much of that on this end of the pond. So I started like going down that rabbit hole and they're like, yeah. They have this like thing called Odin Week. I was like, oh cool, that sounds awesome. Went back to the US, uh, finished my degree, went through some like uh, very intense like personal family problems. Okay. One of my family members got sick. Mm. Um, I was going to move to New York earlier, but the, I don't know, the way I was brought up and coming back to like my Hispanic culture, mm -hmm. um, I was like, I need to be here for this. You know, my mm. grandmother, I can't leave. Mm. Um, so. Then I ended up cultivating myself in South Florida, um, learning a lot here. And, um, and then I was like, I'm going to go to the Odin Theater. So I, I can totally continue on this rant, but if there's more questions that you'd like to ask. Oh, so in terms of actually the Odin Theater is that when you were lear learning there, what language did they teach in? Yeah, so, and so how Claire, okay. So to clarify, because this can get a little confusing. Okay. Um, the Odin Theater okay. is a theater company that's been around for, I want to say, 50 years. 
Okay. Um, they've been touring since like the '60s, and this and most they've had this core of actors that have mostly stayed the same. They've had people coming in and out. Their basis is in uh, they're an experimental theater company. Okay. Mr. Daniel Barba is the director, so he directs them and they do exercises. Their work is based a lot in physical theater okay. um, and physicality, and they create their own work. Um, and they're amazing. Uh, but that's like what the Odin Theater, th there's the theater company, and then the place, I guess, we can also call like the Odin Theater. Right. Excuse me. They have a subset of that called Nordis, uh, Nordisk Theater Laboratorio. Um, okay. it's, it's in Danish, so it's, sometimes it throws me off. Um, so that is like, there's the Odin Theater, like the main members of that theater, and then the Nordisk Theater Laboratorium is like for everyone else, kind okay. of. Um, so I don't, I'm not a part of the, the Odin Theater, because they have like their mm. basis of actors. I'm a part of like, kind of think of it like a tree, so I'm like a little branch that comes from um, the actors. So there's two actors in the, in the company that have okay. kind of created their own groups outside of it. So I've learned from them which has been mind, a mind-blowing experience. Mm -hmm. um, one, uh, actually three members. Um, Carolina Pizarro, she speaks English and Spanish. Her husband, Luis Alonso, Alfonso, excuse me, he also speaks English uh, and Spanish. And Donald Kitt, who's from Canada, so he speaks English. Okay. Um, the Odin Theater is made up of actors because we've all learned from them in workshops or classes. Just being there, you learn. Right. Um, and they each speak, I wanna say, about four to five languages including Danish. Um, so I know, for example, like Miss Julia Varley speaks Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Danish, English. I can't remember what else, but, and they learned it through time, right? Like it's, it's ridiculous. They do their shows. They'll do the show in English. And then the next night they'll be like, oh, well, we have an audience that's coming from somewhere in South America. They speak Spanish and they'll do the whole show in Spanish. That's the whole show. Intense. So they teach in English, but because I speak English and Spanish, sometimes we would go in between. And I can understand, being there, I can understand a little bit of Italian and a little bit more Portuguese because okay. some of the actors, that, and the actors that go to train there also come from all over the world. Wow. So you learn so much, you know, about like Hong Kong and Taiwan and Australia and Germany. And like, it's, that's, that was the best education to me is meeting other artists from a different part of the world who had a different perspective and a different um, thing to give. If that no, that's, that's definitely really like, so in our art, art, art form, we, we try to learn, I would imagine, and try to understand many people from backgrounds that are fundamentally night and day sometimes. Like you, you, you meet them and there's a, an openness in this community, which is why I, I'm so happy to be a part of it. And there's a lot of people that think of acting as just the A-list celebrity, the Leonardo DiCaprio, the Tom Hanks. They forget that there's a lot of people that take part in this community. So people that aspire to be actors, like there's a younger person, little girl that goes, hey, I, I look up to you. How do I get into this? Because for, for a lot of cultures and a lot of people, they don't think of acting as something that they can pursue because it seems so pinnacle of Hollywood. Mm. Um, well, I think the first thing would be to say that you can do it and that it is a privilege. Uh, and I'm fully aware of that. Being an actor, being any sort of artist is a privilege. I was very lucky um, to grow up in the U.S., you know, where uh, my English is, is pretty good and English is the standard of, unfortunately, like film in, in the U.S. right now. Things are changing with dubbing and like subtitles and all that, but English is mostly the dominant, you know, language. So I'm very lucky in that. I'm very lucky to be in a, in a position um, where I can be an artist, where I don't have to work to sustain a family mm -hmm. right now. You know what I mean? Uh, where I'm not trying to get anyone out of a hole um, or myself out of a hole. So I, I have a privilege in that. That be, Calling yourself an artist is a privilege. Um, so I just wanted to start by saying that because there are people who cannot pursue it professionally because mm. of that, because it is a really difficult career um, or who do pursue it professionally, but um, it's just different. You know what I mean? It's different to pursue a career in the arts in the US 
versus in Venezuela. Because in the U.S., yes, there's this glitz and glamour of Hollywood, but there's at least a chance that you can make money and make a living and have a life doing it. Mm. Um, whereas in other places, not so much, you know? Um, like, so that, that first off, if somebody asked me, I want to be an artist, you know, I would say, follow your, your gut, follow your passion, um, know your purpose. You know, if you really in your heart believe that you were put on this earth to be an actor, then be an actor. You know, mm. I personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with ambition because I'm a very ambitious person. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be in a big Hollywood film. Um, I think it's just keeping your integrity throughout that process. You know, it's keeping, it's like, why do you want to be an actor? Mm. Is it because you want to be in front of a camera and on stage and performing? Um, because if you ask me, that was why I didn't, so right, when I, when I first decided to be an actor or when, mm -hmm. when that, acting bug was coming along for me. At first, I didn't understand what acting was or the, the value that it had for society. So I was just like, like, it just feels like such an egotistical choice mm. for me personally, right? I was like, yeah, like I love being in front of the stage, but there's something more and I couldn't figure it out. And I was very lucky to have mentors who said, who started saying like, but acting has the power to like, change the way people see things or have people connect and empathize with other human experiences that they've never seen before. And I was just like, that's why I want to do it. That's literally, I want to like unite people or I want people to understand each other or I want there to be more peace and love as cheesy as that sounds like peace and love, because I think we can only understand, like we can only love each other at times. It seems like when mm. you can understand the other person and empathize with their experience. So I was like, that's why I want to be an actor. So if somebody were to ask me, like, I want to be an actor, I would ask them, why do you want to be an actor? Is it because mm. it feeds your soul and that's what you feel like your purpose is? Or is it for your ego? If it's mm. for your ego, that's fine. I might not agree necessarily with it because there's a, there's a sense of ego in actors. Mm. Like, let's not like kid ourselves. You know, you right. have to have a certain degree of ego and, and I don't mean negative ego. I mean like confidence because mm. you're getting on a stage and you're asking an audience of three to 400 plus people to pay attention to you. Mm. So you better be able to deliver some sense of like, look at me, I'm worth looking at, you know, mm. and I'm good enough because if not, you're going to scare the hell out of yourself on stage. Mm. And that's something people don't often talk about, but it's true. Actors have egos or confidence is another way to say it. They have a certain degree of that, but th there's a point where it gets toxic, you know? So I would ask like, and, and there's, again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, do you want to do this professionally? Because if your ego needs to be on a stage, there's too much rejection in this business. Mm. Like you're going to be crushed by the end of it. You know, <laughs> like your ego isn't going to be satisfied at all. Mm. Um, and you're going to be like, nobody wants me. And why won't anyone hire me? And, you know, like all that. So I would say, follow your heart and do what you think you were put on this earth to do. And don't let anything stop you mm. because there's going to be stuff to stop you. You know, like, you're going to try to be an actor and you're going to get a door shut in your face and you have to be determined enough in what you want to not give up mm. and determined enough to, to put yourself in a vulnerable position where you're, you're going to fall. It's just going to happen. Mm. You know, it's the nature of life. You're going to fall and you have to get back up and you have to want it bad enough to get back up when you're down. You know, when you haven't worked in a couple months, when you did this project and you spent hours on it and like the person you worked with just wasn't the person or they cut you weird or your, your singing was not in sync with your like talking and it, you know, and then it gets projected on a big screen and you're just like, I want to die. I want to crawl under a rock. Like this isn't my best work, you know, because there's certain things you don't have control over. And so when you're down in those moments, you have to like say, I want this so bad. I wake up in the morning and I love this. There's nothing else I want to do, you know? And that, that's what it is that, you know, like I'm, I've had personal relationships where I've looked at my partners and I've said, I love you. I want to be with you, but this feeds my soul. Mm. So I'm never gonna not do something because, you know, and I've been lucky to have a partner that like understands that. And is like, okay, you know, it's not that she's picking something over me. It's that this literally is a part of her soul and like a part of mm. who she is and like what she does with her life. That, you know, that, it's also surrounding cool. yourself with, with the right people to be honest. Like that, like I, I, it's, it's definitely something that a lot of people find 
soul crushing when they they because the competition is fierce for mm-hmm. actors I, I would imagine and how, and a lot of people the perception of acting is can i say these lines and then here i go here's hollywood how important is preparation training working on your craft so to speak because it's an art form that has to be worked on that's more than just what people see on the surface hmm. i'm going to quote my uh, my brilliant teacher sergey ostrenko um and i'm gonna ask you a question sure. Brian. if you had to get um heart surgery okay would you let an amateur heart surgeon like do the procedure I would prefer not to. <laughs> so then why do we let amateur artists do surgery on your soul? Like that's, it's, that's it's actually very of, profound. That's actually, yeah. That's yeah. Really and, and he said, I mean, I might be honestly like re- rephrasing it a little in how he said it, but it's like, you wouldn't trust an amateur surgeon to do heart surgery on you. So why do you trust an amateur anything to do surgery on your soul you know especially artists that's not to say that there's anything wrong with doing it as a hobby Mm. um but when you say that you're a professional and that you want to dedicate your life to something i think that elevates it to a different standard and a Mm. different requirement um i personally get really annoyed when people wake up in the morning just they just woke up one day you know and just you're like i did three lines in a movie and i'm an actor you know and i'm like who's stanislavski who? Who's Chekhov? What are the great works? Who was the first actor? Where did theater start? Where did Western theater start? Where did Eastern theater start? You know, like, what is mask play? And they don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with um, not knowing, because there was a point I didn't know where nobody knew any of it. Most of my education, I did not go to a conservatory for acting. Mm Let's, let's make that clear. I, my education has been like, I went to Europe and I studied with this teacher, I studied with this teacher, I studied, I have created my own education. Mm. Um, because after I got out of college, I was like, I don't, like, who can, honestly, who can afford to go to a, cons- not everyone can afford to go to a conservatory, you know? Mm. Um, and I found it very like, you do A and B and then you get C, and that's not what it is. So sorry, back, back to my point is like, I think you have to train. I think you have to want to know. Because mm. Brian, I'll tell you, I went, to, I went to college with a ton of people who studied theater, who were like, I'm going to graduate, I'm going to be an actor, blah, blah, blah. Four years later, they're not actors. Mm. They're not. And it's because they either thought it was easier than it was going to be, mm. or they didn't want it bad enough. You know? And I've known actors who did not go to conservatories, but they're hungry, and they mm. want to learn, and it, there's no excuse. Like, the internet is out there. And I'm not saying I learned all of this overnight. I'm saying... I get annoyed when people don't want to learn it. Mm. They don't want to know. They just want to be on TV. And I'm like, you need to know the history of your profession. You need to know where it started. For some reason, this is the only profession (laughs) or one of the only professions where you don't learn the history or the basis. People pick up a script and they go, these are my instincts. And again, it's a creative field. That's what art is, right? Like I can, right, I can take a canvas right now and paint a picture. I'm not Picasso. I'm doing that. I'm, I'm expressing myself creatively. Right. And then the, the metaphorical question is like, is that art? Right. Mm. Me as an, an actor, I'm like, you can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't shine your diamond, you know, or like take care of your craft, it's literally a muscle. You have to, you know, Picasso, I want to say it was Picasso that said inspiration must find you working, you know, because sometimes as artists, like there's days you wake up, you're like, I really don't want to do this scene or like, mm-hmm. I don't want to like, do x y and z but you're just like i have to because then when i need to pull something out of the universe to be creative the right. muscle is working you know it like comes from somewhere so i think it's incredibly important to be training it, but i think it's even more important the intention with which you train are you training because you want to be and, and screw everyone else because a flower when it blooms doesn't worry about the flower next to it blooming you know it's like i I've, my mentality has changed very much from like, mm-hmm. this is a competition between you and me for this role. Right. To, this is a competition with myself of how good can I be? Right. And that brings me peace because you know what? If I don't get something or I do, 
I'm like, then it wasn't for me. I have a lot of faith in the universe. You know, Reese Witherspoon said um, something along the lines of like, getting, the, getting no is like a blessing in disguise. Because you don't know, maybe that project wasn't right for you. You know, so back to, so, so, to, to bring it all together. Um, training is important, but the intention with which you train is more important. Why are you training? What are you trying to learn? Pay attention, like, is it your ego going like, oh, I need to do this or whatever, or is it literally like you can humble yourself to be like, I don't know, I wanna know, please teach me. Mm -hmm. And then also being able to filter out what you want and what you don't wanna take from a class. You know, my, Sergey said this brilliant thing to me. Um, he said, when you're choosing a class, when you're choosing a teacher, when you're choosing a master, um, you can ask as many questions as you want. You can be super, you know, like, uh, decis indecisive and like, like, you know, really overanalyze it. He's like, but once you choose a teacher, you have to commit to what they're teaching you. Mm. Obviously, unless it's like, you know, you're unsafe or you feel uncomfortable or they're, at, you know, like there, obviously there's those things, but he's like, when you pick a teacher, commit. You know, so like every teacher I've ever had that I have chosen, I've committed. I'm like, I'm going to learn as much as I can from you. And then that has brought me relationships. That has brought me, you know, because people don't do that. Right. Ego gets in the way. And I've seen it in classes all the time. Ego gets in the way. It's like, you don't want to look ugly. You don't want to get vulnerable. You don't want to do these things. It's like, you have to commit because it's the only way you're going to grow as, a, as an artist. No one can do it for you. You know, it's like your mom can't, uh, your mom, your dad, your sister, your whatever loved ones can't come and be like, Oh, take this pill and you're going to be a great actor. So that's actually, every day. So how, how people starting out, yeah. what, like typically, they, of course, not all, everyone just gets the lead role starting out. They're going to do extra work, background work, supporting work. How do you view artists that are happy to do that versus people that might have a sense of arrogance, entitlement, or ego that go, eh, if it, 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 it's, it's lead or bust? I think ego is insecurity to some degree. Um, I think there's something else going on there. I mean, it annoys me, but there's a part of me that's like empathetic to it. And I'm like, there's something obviously off. I think as an artist, you're an instrument and you have to be clear um, in, in terms of like being able to, and, and that also depends on your technique, but being able to be an actor and also be professional on the set. Mm. You know, so it's like, I, personally, life, life is, has its ups and downs, you know, there's days where I have really hard days, um, like everyone, mm -hmm. and I go on a set, and I'm like, this can't come with me, my mm. grandmother would say, she's like, déjalo en la puerta, you know, when I'm at work, I'm at work, and I'm fully present in what I'm doing, mm. I'm not thinking, I just got into a fight with this person, oh my god, like, I'm having, I have to go to the DMV tomorrow, like, it's being present, and that, Actors, the thing that people, I think the, the most common misconception is that acting is just acting. Like acting is like, I go to acting class and I learn and then like, I'm a good actor. It's like, no, like your musicians have like a flute, right? Or like a mm -hmm. violin. They take care of that, mm -hmm. right? They take care of their violin, their flute. They clean it. They practice every single day. Actors, your instrument is your body. Mm -hmm. And that includes your physical body, your mental state, as well as your emotional and spirituality. And I don't necessarily mean religiousness, but I think actors move energy a lot. Mm. Um, I think actors need to understand energy. So I, for example, I do Tai Chi um, and meditation because that feeds a certain part of my artistic life. I um, do exercise, I dance still, I practice every day because you would never tell a musician like, it's, it's crazy to me. Dancers, and, and this started because I, I started as a dancer. Dancers practice every day. Musicians practice every day. Maybe one or two days off, but for the most part, every day. Actors are like the only ones I've found that it's like, they don't practice. They're like, no, I got it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You need to do something every day. And my whole life revolves around acting. Everything I eat that I put into my body, like revolves around acting. Like I don't eat dairy because it's not good. Like I personally have a really bad reaction to dairy and then like it affects my voice. And if I get a call tomorrow to be on set or to do a theater play, it's like, I can't have my voice like this. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it affects what I eat. It affects like my meditation routine. And like, like you really have to understand yourself well as an actor. So when mm. you're starting out, 
like you need to understand that like it depends on what you want if you want to do this as a hobby that's a different that's a different thing mm. you want to do this as a profession it's a lifestyle it's a hundred percent a lifestyle um you know i've missed i've had birthdays that i haven't been able to do because birthdays christmases whatever um because new year which is huge in my family because i'm doing a show or i'm practicing or i'm doing this mm. and my family supports me you know but it's a lifestyle choice that that's the thing is like i don't personally i don't think it really works that well when people kind of half ass into it where they're just like i'm kind of an actor and i'm like transitioning into it it's like i get it but it is a lifestyle it 100 percent is a lifestyle because you're also keeping relationships with people mm -hmm. there's only so many hours in the day because as actors you know when you're not working you also have a day job so it's like my question when i was looking for my day job was like how can i try to find something that supports my acting because I'm going to spend eight hours a day doing this job, but then how does this job support me artistically to feed back into my acting? Like everything I do feeds back into my acting, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not to say I don't have like personal relationships and things outside of acting, but most of, you know, like what I do is that, you know, because everything, like the articles I read, the books I read every night, um, the contacts that I make, the, the people I reach out to and talk to. But then you still have to reach out to other people because, mm. you know, if you're saturating your life with only actors, then right. you're missing out on like other human experiences. So I don't disagree with like living your life in other ways, but I think if you're trying to do this professionally, there's, it's another standard. So you, you know, if you're starting out and you're like, I want to be a professional actor, it's like, it's a one, it's like a lifestyle choice. Um, and two, it's like, are you willing to make those sacrifices for your art form and how bad do you want it? And why do you want it? That's actually interesting because like reading a script, it could be just one page long mm -hmm. or just 20 lines, but you, even that takes a lot of hours to memorize, get down, get into the, get the right action, get the right intent. And it, it's time consuming beyond just, mm -hmm. just seeing it. And the other aspect of it is that you bring up a very good point is that it's a commitment and there's an ego, but what about people that take, how about professionalism and respect in the industry towards everyone involved? Like, do you ever get people that are like walk in and like, for example, rude to the receptionist because they, they think that certain people are lesser forms to try to get to the casting director. How important do you think is like an overall professionalism or an overall niceness? I think it's what type of human being you want to be. Um, because this is my personal opinion. Um, we all have bad days, we all have good days. It doesn't mean you get to take it out on somebody else or impose your feelings on somebody else. We're all just trying to figure it out. Um, that's the degree of empathy I'm talking about in, in actors and artists that I think is necessary. That doesn't mean let people step on you. That doesn't mean don't stand up for yourself. It just means why would I want someone to be fake nice to me if they're actually a jerk? Like if you're actually a jerk and you have all those problems inside of you where you feel like it's okay to be mean to other human beings, you need to fix that as an artist. Like you need to self-reflect and be like, why do I do that? Um, because I think what comes across and what works is gen being genuine. Mm. Being a genuine human being, actually caring about other people besides yourself. That's what comes through. Because mm. if you're fake nice to someone, there's so much of that in this industry. There's so much of like, oh my God, like I loved like what you did and it was so good. And they're freaking lying to your face. Do you know what I'm saying? And that comes through. People can tell when you're a jerk and you're just like trying to get something from them. And granted, that is what, what the human experience is in a sense. Like someone is always trying to get something from someone else, you know, whether it's parents and kids, you know, it's like love and affection. Any relationship has that, the give and the take, right? But I think, again, it comes back to like intention and are you being genuine? Like, are you genuinely asking someone, hey, how's your day? Because you give up an, an F. <laughs> or because you're trying to get something from them. Mm. And I don't think it's healthy to live your life just trying to overtly get something from someone in that way, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and yeah, like, you know what? People are rude. Again, I, when I was younger, cause I'm, I'm a Scorpio, so I have very, a very strong personality um, in some ways, but I, uh, like, 
and I used to get really upset sometimes, you know, when it's like people would be rude or you'd be on set with someone and they were just a jerk and you were just like, mm, like, can you just be a kind, normal human being? And they were just being rude and rude and rude. And I asked Sergey, my, again, going back to my master teacher, and I asked him one day, I was like, what do you do when, you know, you're, you're in a situation where someone is really heavy or they're bringing down the mood or it's just like, you can't work. And he goes, you smile. You work through it. He's like, you don't let anyone disrespect you. You know, like, obviously you defend yourself in certain instances. He's like, you smile, you work through it. You never work with that person again. Mm. You never work with that. Per- and I've seen it happen on sets. It's like someone, I, I, did, a, I did a play and the lead uh, girl, woman, she's actually a woman, she had a meltdown five minutes before we were supposed to go on stage and she got in her car and drove off. Wow. Yeah. And then she came back, you know, and like, but she didn't tell us she was coming back. So this is like, all of us had been rehearsing for two weeks and we're just like, like, how are we? And they're like, Andrea, you're going to take her role. I'm like, how am I going to play two characters at once? And like this, and you know, and there were like puppets involved. And, um, and then she had to come back and we had to like make, do the show and like make it happen, you know, but can you imagine if the whole cast, because we had reason to be upset with right. this person, but it's like, imagine if the whole cast had just been like, you're a jerk and like, we don't want to work with, you know what I mean? You know, so we smile and you get through it and you're just like, and not to be disingenuous, but you try to like, you smile because you're trying to find the positive because you're trying to do the work because at the end of the day, <laughs> One day on set, even if it's a bad day, is better than any day off. You know, mm-hmm. because it's what we do. It's what we love to do. So you try to find the positive and just, like, get through it. And that's what makes you stand out. That's what makes people remember you. That's what makes people go, in the worst of times, this person keeps it together professionally, and I can count on them. You know? Because wow. filmmaking and even theater, it's crazy sometimes. Like, stuff happens, and people are putting out fires, and it's like, I put myself in their position, like, do I want to put out a fire, like, while someone is being a jerk or while someone's being a diva or what, you know, and that's, again, that's not to say that if something inappropriate is going on and something unprofessional is going on that you shouldn't defend yourself because you should, or you shouldn't speak up for yourself because you should (laughs) always, but it's how you do that, right? Like, are you going to someone yelling, I can't believe that you guys didn't put green M&Ms in my bowl? Or are you a polite human being and are you like, hello, hi? Um, I'm not going to let you step on me or treat me like less, but I think there's been some sort of mistake. Can you please fix this? Because if you don't, you know, and you say it politely, right. and that's professionalism. Um, but when you just lose it, like who wants to work with that? Who wants mm. to work with someone who's losing it on set? You know, I, I, that's just my opinion. That's why I always say like, I try to separate professional and um, personal, but that doesn't right. always happen. And sometimes, honestly, you go to a job and the director can be really rude or mean and you're just like trying to navigate how can I work around this in the most polite way keep my class keep you know stay true to who I am mm. and who I want to be in this industry work through this but then also you know you can go home and just like oh look at that hard you know it sometimes it bleeds over we're human it happens mm. um but trying to keep in mind why you do things mm. if you're being genuine and like who you are as a person who you want to be you know are you that guy who just like makes funny comments or like, I, you know, I, when I get nervous, I laugh and, like, <laughs> and people are like, what, what is wrong with you? Like, this is a serious situation. I'm like, I know. I just, it's, it's a nervous take, you know? Um, and I know that. So when I, you, when you interact with other people, you know what, who you are and like what you do. And that's so important as a newbie. So I hope that answered the question. I know sure, it definitely of, did, which, which brings me to, I, I had two other uh, ones in mind. One, one is that how do you, Get, oh, like, do you ever get afraid, afraid of networking or meeting new people? And how important is networking and meeting new people? And how would people meet new people in this particular field to build those connections, to build those relationships, to be able to get jobs? And Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to meet people, but I think it's also important to mesh with people. Um, I... What's the difference? Um, sometimes you meet people, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and the conversation was, hi, my name is Andrea, uh, I'm, you know, it's really nice to see you, I, I genuinely enjoyed watching your film, it's like, oh, thank you, you know, it's, it was amazing, um, it's the masterpiece, and, oh, yeah, you know, out in LA, like, we're, we're actually doing these other films, and, um, they're amazing, and, you know, this, 
this one super famous celebrity said it was amazing, so like we all know it's amazing, and like, aren't I amazing? Um, that's meeting people sometimes. And then meeting people and liking people is like, hey, um, I genuinely liked your project. You know, you did this like one thing that was cool and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh my God, yeah, like, and you did this, or thank you so much, like that meant something, you know? Um, sometimes you meet people and you just, you don't mesh. You know off the bat. Mm. I always say, listen to your gut. Your gut will never lie to you. Mm. I, I discourage personally um, on my journey and like what I want to do in, in my life. It's like, I don't want to work with people who have no interest in even having a basic human conversation with somebody else or mm -hmm. uh, I give it the give and the take, you know, the like, I want something, I want something, you know, I want you to praise me. Mm -hmm. um, I think building those relationships has to come from a place of genuine um, trust and respect and um, like love for the work. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of friends that I've made, it's because I see the good in the work. If that mm. makes sense. Uh, like, everything can be seen as positive or negative. Um, there's people that I've met, it's like, maybe the work isn't amazing, honestly. Like, maybe they're so-so, and they're still learning, and that's totally good. But it's like, if your work is so-so, but you're, like, a nice human being, and you're trying to get better, and you want to learn, and you're, like, nice, I would much rather work with you than someone who might be super amazing but is a jerk. Mm. It's just not good for anyone's health to be on, on set with a jerk for eight hours. And it happens, you know? Um, and then there's also ways of, like, working around that, you know, like, making friends with people who might be perceived initially as rude. Because, you know, again, I say jerks very broadly, but, but that usually might just be that maybe we don't mesh or, like, I don't understand something about you. And I need right. to understand that. And then we can, like, mesh and, like, work and, like, it's fine. Mm. You know? But um, I think networking is important because it's a community. We're a community, you know? Like we have to help each other. But I think it's who you surround yourself with. It's your tribe. Because surrounding yourself with people who are not good for you and who don't support you um, and who like cut you down for their own ego um, is not helpful. But don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I mean, look, my mom, my mom used to say, um, and I'm always quoting other people who are, you know, who have had more experience than me, who've taught me things. But like right. my mother used to say, she's like, there's different types of friends. There's the friends that you tell secrets to. There's the friends that you um, you know, go out and party with, there's the friends that you go baking with, you know, there's different because people are different. Friendships are different. So I think networking is like one, a mutual respect and also just building a genuine relationship because there's so much BS mm. in the industry of like, ah, oh my God, I'm going to tell you things to feed your ego, you know, and you find that, but I have friends that I show stuff to and they're just like, nah, I don't like it. And I'm like, cool cool, why don't you like it? Tell me, you know, give me, but they're saying it out of positive feedback, one. Mm. And two, they're not kissing my butt just so that I'll be friends with them or work with them or whatever. And, and I don't do that to other people either. And that's why I have genuine friendships mm. because when something is wrong, I'll tell you like, man, you, you know, I love you, bro, but like you messed up on this. Mm. You just you messed up. And it, granted, your, your friendship has to get to that point. Um, and I would also just suggest like, if you have a new friendship, don't ask anyone for like a major favor for a while. Mm. Like don't be friends with somebody and be like, Hey, can you introduce me to your agent? No, I don't. Who are you? I don't know. You, you know what I mean? Like right. you have to end and they take time and they take, um, relationships take, take a lot of time and effort. You, you can't just superficially step in and step your fingers. Like here's a compliment. We're best friends now. People think they can though. And it's, and mm. it comes off as non-genuine, you know, and you have to, you pick your friends. Like, don't think as an actor that you have to chase everyone and be like, oh my God, this guy's like a huge director and like he can take me places and whatever. Go meet that human being. It's not, oh my God, this director. It's, oh my God, that human being. What do you like in their work? Genuinely. Like, not to tell them to feed their ego so they freaking like you, but right. what did you see in their work that you liked? There's always something you can like. You know, even if it's just the curve of their eyebrow. Um, you know, and, and that goes with working with people that are jerks or like rude or that you don't mesh with. It's like, okay, they're hard to work with, but like, what do you like about them? There has to be like one thing, even if it's the way their nose curves around their face or this like one curl they have, you know, that mentality will help mm. because you're not trying to get something, you know, I mean, you are, but it's coming from a genuine place. So why not look for friendship instead of like what you can get?
how, how many challenges and difficulties have you had over the course of time mm -hmm. of dealing with negativity, negative people, people that don't support you? And how do you ignore the sayers as Arnold Schwarzenegger would say? Mm -hmm. um, a lot. It's, I'm a fighter. And I think you have to be a fighter if you want to be an actor or any sort of artist. You gotta be a fighter because it's not necessarily people; it's the world, in a way, not the universe. I'll, I'll clarify. Um, the world in the sense of society. Hmm. The world in the sense of you go to people, you know, and they're like, "What do you do?" I'm an actor, and they're just like really confused. They're either really confused, and you can see in their eyes that they're just like, "How do you make money?" Um, <laughs> or they're, you know, they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I wanted to do that. You know, like there's the sense of like, I wanted to, to be that, but I couldn't because of X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, you have to focus on you. You have no control over what anyone else does. You have no control if you make a film and someone likes it or doesn't. You have no control over what other people feel. Mm. You have no control over what other people say to you. Everyone, we live in the US, everyone is free to say whatever they want within, you know, context of fire in a crowded theater and stuff like that. Yeah. But like, you know, if somebody doesn't like me, they could be like, Andrea, I, you know, this. And you really have to build your, your self-esteem and your self-worth. Mm. And you have to love yourself um, regardless of what happens, you know, and you have to be kind to yourself. That's not to say be lazy. There's, there's like a difference. Sometimes people go either way. You know, sometimes people have like really low self-esteem and then they're just like, well, why bother? Or... They're like, I have to get this right because if I don't, I'm going to mess up, you know, which that isn't healthy. And then the other side of it isn't healthy either, where it's like, oh my God, I'm so amazing. And then the work that they do isn't good because they don't push themselves. You mm. know, you have to find that balance and then you really have to love yourself and care about what you're doing, how you do things, mm. how, how you, you choose to be an artist, because that gives you integrity. When you do things the right way, in my opinion, or what you consider to be the right way, but you genuinely in your heart believe this is the right way to do things. This is the right way to treat another human being. Um, you're either going to like learn also along the way other things that you can add to that. Mm -hmm. um, but that builds your integrity as a person. Because then you're, you're like, this is what I think is right. And I'm not, even if it costs me money, even if it costs me a job, even if it costs me whatever, like, this is my integrity. Like, this is what I believe in. And this is what I'm not going to do. And that feeds you as an artist um, and that feeds you as a human being. And that is what keeps you aligned when everyone is pulling you in different directions and people are saying, oh my God, you should do this role. And you're just like, but I don't believe in it. Um, or people are telling you, you can't be an actor. You can't do this. You know, you like, what are you doing? Um, and then also to be honest, like not having those people around you because you don't need it. You know, like I've had mm -hmm. friendships where past friendships where people supported me as an artist, but like they didn't. And it didn't come from a place of like, at least from my perception from like, oh my God, like I'm worried about you. Like, how are you gonna make money? You know what I'm saying? Versus like, I, you know, I wish I could do that, but like, you can't do it. It's like, why, why are you saying that? You know, it's like, uh, just cause I think you, and it's like, okay, so that's your problem, not mine. You're just mm. projecting your insecurities on me. So it's, it's really like, um, being secure in who you are and finding yourself and loving yourself and forgiving yourself and also being able to learn. And that's why I say like development, Stella Adler said like growth as a human being is like growth as an actor. And it's so true. You have to grow as a human being to be able to grow as an artist and as an actor and be able to like be tenacious and don't give up. And you have to want to get up, you know, and maybe sometimes it'll take you a month to get up or two months. It'll take you a little longer, but you have to want to keep getting up and doing it. Mm. And um, after a while, it gets easier to get up and then you find other things that fill your, your soul, you know, because sometimes, honestly, it's like when you're starting out, like money is hard, like mm. as, a, as an actor and let, you know, cause you're, there's a lot of competition and like whatever you want. So it's like being able to get up and like doing it is what brings you joy. Like, you know, like, okay, I'm not getting paid a lot, but like, I love doing this. But then the balance of also being able to say, but this is my worth and this is what right. I deserve be paid right hmm. so it's always like a constant balancing act with all of that but i think integrity as an artist is what keeps you standing when the whole society is like you can't do this you can't, blah, blah, blah. 
Yeah. How, how important is integrity and reputation oh. to you as an artist or yeah, yeah. Uh, consistency is uh, super important consistency in how you treat people in who you are in um, how you choose to do things mm. in how people know you and perceive you um, in the sense that you can't control what other people think I can't control Brian like if you like me or you don't like me I can't control that and I can't live my life thinking, oh my God, he likes me, oh my God, he doesn't, oh my God, he likes my work, oh my God, he doesn't. Like, I do the work because I'm an artist and that's the work I do and that's what I love to do and if you like it, that's great. And I would love to work with you and if you don't, that's cool too, I respect it, you know? Um, I think your reputation takes 10 years to build and five minutes to destroy. Um, I think that's why it's important to be consistent in who you are as a person and show people who you are. Mm. Um, not put on a mask because you know how hard it is to like balance three different like to be an actor do all the characters that we do and then on top of it put on a mask that isn't you you know I, I think when you're a kind human being um, people know who you are so that if it ever does occur where somebody comes up and says like this person's a jerk or like oh that Andrea like I don't like her she was so rude or whatever there's enough people in your community who are like well that doesn't sound like her Mm. Like that's so, you know, because you hear it once and you're just like, oh, okay, but if what you hear is so contrasting to like who you are, do you get what I'm saying? If you hear it consistently, that's something else. Right. But, but for the most part, like reputation is so important. And if somebody recommends you for anything, you better treat that sacred. Like it's mm. sacred. Like if you have a friend who's like, I have an agent and like, I'm going to refer you, you better bust your butt doing the best that you can, making the best impression possible, because that's your friend's reputation on the line too, mm. because they're recommending you. Don't take that for granted. You know, it, it has a very heavy weight because, and that's why me personally, like if someone's like, can you recommend me? I either say yes or no. I'm either like, yes, I can, because I believe in you or no, but I don't give out recommendations to every person because what happens? You recommend somebody, somebody else, <laughs> you know, like they, they show up late. They don't have the right headshot. They're rude human beings. And then they're, they, I, get, I get the call. Andrea, why did you recommend this person? They're really yeah. rude. And then that starts affecting my reputation. And you know how hard that is to build. It's super hard to build a reputation. Right. That's why self-discipline is so important. That's why it's so important to know how to be professional, how to be professional on set, how to have human communications with people. And then the other thing I always say is, like, don't talk BS about your co-stars, your mm. co-workers at work, to other workers, it's the st in any industry, not even acting. It's like the stupidest thing for me, and and I get it. There's a part of me that's like, I understand that you know you need to vent or whatever, but unless it's it's for a purpose, unless it's like I feel unsafe and I need to have a discussion because this person has made these comments and they're inappropriate or what, like in a professional sense, it's you know it, it's it, it just creates toxicity. Like mm -hmm. me personally, Brian. Like if I have a problem with somebody, I come home and I like tell my dog and I vent to my dog and I'm like, cool, you know, that's a healthy way of doing that. Um, but it's just like, that's part of protecting your reputation. It's like, mm. why, why are we in preschool? Like, is it necessary for you to vent your frustrations about other human beings on, do you know what I'm saying? And, right. And so that's reputation is sacred. Other people's reputation that you trust and love and have built is also sacred. Mm. Um, it's having respect for other people, the way that you have respect for yourself. So that's my two cents about it. Wow. So if some, some, and this is what where I'm going to end up asking you my final question, which is where do you, what are your ambitions and where do you want to be? I have a lot of specific ambitions. Um, I don't generally communicate them i they're like in my heart and i put them in the universe in my meditations but i don't say them out loud for the most part um i will say that my goal is to fulfill what i believe to be my life's purpose um, which is to help other people and i want to help other people through my art form um and i don't mean it in a an egotistical way of like, oh my God, my art is so amazing. It's going to change lives and like help people, you know? And like, that's what's going to happen. Um, it's just in my heart, I feel like what I need to do with my life is create art. And my art tends to lean towards 
humanity and like human experience with the intention of trying to connect people or trying to explore some facets of hum the human experience um, for myself. And I'm an ever-changing, like ever-growing artist. You know, things change. If you ask me like what my career aspirations is, it's like I would love to, you know, have stability and this and only work with people I really love and only do projects that I really love and feel like would have a positive impact on the world. You know, um, that's my like career goals. But my my deeper artistic goals and goals as a human being is like just to keep learning, to keep growing every day, to be the best version of me possible, to make the world better, even if that's just being kind to someone who needs it in a specific moment, you know, because it's so important. Um, and to create work that that helps, I guess, that helps people understand each other or that shares some sort of experience. I think it's, it's really important and really beautiful. Um, that we're all so different in the world and, um, and that we have differing opinions and differing experiences and um, the different like facets of humanity. So that's my goal is just to, to put my piece, I guess, of my work and myself into the world. I, wa I want the world to be a little better um, when I leave it, you know. Um, I think that's, that's every human being also. It's like you would hope that you're born and make you before you pass you, you put something into the world to make it better with the intention of like making it better so that's uh my goal as an artist and i hope um you know to have a lovely community around me and people that enjoy my work or the people that um like it but if not that's you know it's subjective i can't you can't live your life going like oh my god are they gonna like it but um but there is the part that you're like you hope it helps people because that's what theater and film and art did for me through really difficult times in my life. It has helped me. Um, so I hope to do that for someone else. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. Oh, and thank you. on my show, and I'm sure the rest of the YouTube audience is going to definitely be thankful. And I can't, I'm looking forward to doing yeah. another one of these. Yeah, I would love, I, and you can check out my YouTube channel too. It's literally no, my name. So um, for drop. everyone to know, I'm going to link everything that Andrea wants to send me right in the <laughs> description. So definitely check her out. Fantastic person. I wouldn't have her here otherwise. And I look forward to doing another one of these again with her. Have a good day. Thanks. You too, Brian. <laughs>